So recently, it was my birthday, and my friend Scotty Scruggs called me up. Scotty and I used to work together. Now he's pastor of a Baptist church, my old denomination, up in the Northwest. And he said, John, I'm glad you're in the world. I'm glad you're my friend. This is going to be a great year. I've been talking to a number of people in this area in their 80s, and they're all doing great, so I think you'll be fine. Now the reason that was funny is I'm not actually in my 80s. But Scotty's got a great sense of humor. It's always good to hear from him. I was kind of sad to find out from my old denomination he's losing his ordination status for being cruel to elderly people. But it has caused me also to just kind of reflect on my life. Who do I want to be? What kind of life do I want to be living? So I thought today, as you're thinking about your life and just this day, what kind of life do you want to construct? that it would be fun to contrast two different lives. I've been reading a book by Mary Beard, amazing book, SPQR, on the history of Rome uh, in the ancient world. And towards the end of his life, Caesar Augustus, the most powerful, revered man in this world, wrote about his accomplishments, race uh, gesture, if that's how it's pronounced, the things accomplished by Caesar. And there's some very interesting points of comparison between his life and the life of another man named Jesus. And so I thought we might think about those as you face your day, as you face obstacles and decisions about who do you want to be today. So two different paths you could go on. Here's what Caesar writes. I drove into exile the murderers of my father, avenging their crime through tribunals established by law. And afterwards, when they made war in the Republic, I twice defeated them in battle. Now, what's interesting here is he talks about the men who murdered his father. You might remember Julius Caesar was killed by Brutus and Cassius and Mark Anthony and so. Um, he was not Caesar Augustus's biological father. He was actually Caesar Augustus's adoptive father. Julius Caesar did not have any heirs and he wanted someone to take over. Succession's always a big problem for nations. And so he thought that Julius Caesar could do that. Now with that, by way of backdrop, listen to what the Bible says. Um, about the process and the prospect of being adopted that lies before you and me. Paul says, When the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Now, in our day, usually when we think about adoption, we think about uh, orphans and somebody having compassion on them and wanting to give them a family. And when we read a passage like this, we might wonder, why does Paul restrict it to adoption as sons? This is actually the very passage where he says, now in Christ, uh, there is no longer male or female. So why doesn't he talk about adoption as sons and daughters? Well, there is a reason for this. In the ancient world, like in ancient Rome, as was the case with Caesar Augustus, adoption was not something that was done in order to have pity on orphans or to help them out. If you wanted to, you could take an orphan into your family. No problem. You might make them slaves or members of the household. You could set them free. Uh, adoption was not done of babies. It was actually done when the head of the household did not have a clear heir and wanted to find somebody who would be able to take care of, steward what had mattered most to the potter familia. So uh, Julius Caesar looked around, and Caesar Augustus is obviously a man of immense gifts, and Julius Caesar said, I think he could do it. So when the Bible says that God has adopted us into sonship, that's the picture it's using. God looks at you. God says, I've given you gifts. I've given you abilities. I've given you talents. And now I'm sending my spirit to be with you. So you are my heir. I believe that you will be able to do what it is that I want to accomplish through your life, not through anybody else's life, but through yours. I have given you what you need to do what I'm calling you to do. So if you feel inadequate, if you face any problems or weakness today, do not be discouraged. Second, interesting point of contrast. Uh, Caesar says, I celebrated two ovations and I was 21 times saluted as imperator. The Senate decreed still more triumphs to me, all of which I declined. 
On 55 occasions, the Senate decreed with thanksgiving should be offered to the immortal gods on account of the successes on land and sea gained by me. The days on which thanksgiving were offered in accordance with decrees of the Senate numbered 890. In my triumphs, nine kings or children of kings were led before my chariot. Now, this is kind of a technical uh, event that he's noting, the triumphal procession. And when a king won a great victory in Rome, there would be a particular kind of parade, like a ticker tape parade in our day. And the king would be in a chariot drawn by four horses of the general or whomever. And then in the procession behind him would be the humiliated, defeated captives. And if they were kings, that was a feather in your cap. This was so prized by Caesar that he actually ruled in his day that after him, generals would no longer be able to have this experience. Only the Caesar could. You get to wear purple. You get to wear laurel. You were called ver triumphalis, the triumphant man. Now contrast this with the kind of victory that Jesus won which was not with swords and bows and arrows. Paul says in, Col in his letter to the Colossians, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, not through brutality and war and death, but through the cross, through dying himself. That's the victory that he won. That's the public spectacle. And then, this is really remarkable, Paul refers to that same event. Thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession. Jesus has won the victory, but we don't go around strutting like Caesar, like generals. Paul lived as a slave to Jesus, as a captive. In Christ. Everything's getting turned upside down. So today, if you experience some kind of failure, if it feels like there is opposition that is overcome, don't you feel discouraged? Because we follow the man whose triumphant procession um, was, was achieved by a cross. Then Caesar goes on. This the document, if you've ever read, it's amazing. It's page after page of just you know, uh, amazing boasting. I restored the capital and the theater of Pompeii. He talks about 82 temples that he rebuilt, all this other kind of stuff. Both works at great expense without inscribing my own name on either. I wanted it to be anonymous. I didn't want anybody to know. So I want you to know that I didn't want anybody to know how anonymously generous I was. What a wonderful thing it was. Caesar would have coins inscribed with a picture of himself to go all over the empire. Um, they actually looked much better than the descriptions we have of him. His, the teeth and the, and the coins and those figures were better. The hair was better. They never aged, lived to be 76. Image on the coins, he always looked great. And then Jesus came along and he said, now when you give, if you're tempted to puff yourself up, instead of telling everybody what you do, he says, when you give, don't announce it with trumpets. Now, in Rome, when people gave, they would announce it with trumpets. When Caesar did stuff like this, it would, that's why Jesus said that. Like, people actually did that. Jesus said, no, no, no. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing so that your giving might be in secret. So today, if you feel obscure, unknown, unnoticed, don't you be discouraged. Because your Heavenly Father sees what is done in secret. At the end of... Caesar Augustus's life, Barbara writes about this in the book, the final statement inscribed to him uh, as he was dying to people was, I have played my part well, now give me applause. When Jesus was dying, he was mocked. And what he said was, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Now here's the irony. Caesar was the ruler of the known world if you were to ask, in all of literature since then, what's the mention of Caesar that has been read the most time, that has been studied by the most scholar, that is the most familiar to the human race? And it is a passage written about an act that took place, and it's written in the Gospel of Luke. And it says, uh, in those days Caesar Augustus went out a decree that all the world should be taxed. So Caesar does that, and in a little part of the world where he's never been, a little man that he never knows, never known named, named Joseph, goes to a little town that he would never visit named Bethlehem, where, oh, by the way, the prophecies were that the Messiah would come from. And so the most famous decree that Caesar ever made was the decree that 
uh, entirely unknown to him is responsible for the fulfilling of the prophecy for the greatest work that God has ever done. And the one who, when he was offered the kingship, said no, is the one whose movement is still going on. So that's the life we get to pursue. That's the person that we get to revere. And when you feel weak, when you feel inadequate, when you run up against failure, if you're feeling obscure, don't worry about it. Somebody has been there before you, and he has been there before me. And that's the life that is still changing the world. That's life we get to live today. See you next time.